Thanks. Thank you so much for coming to, to listen to us today. I confess um, I'm rather nervous about this talk for, I think, at least three reasons. Uh, one of them is that I know that the good people of Baldwin are notoriously intelligent, uh, as well as susceptible to flattery. And so you know, I, I, I await your questions. Um, Shall I switch to a handheld mic? This is, are we good? All right. Certainly, the topic I was given is, is rather terrifying. Uh, in about half an hour, I'm going to try to talk to you about how the universe began uh, and how we think it might end. Uh, mostly the warm up act for, for my colleague Justin Belvedel, who I'm looking forward to hearing from. And, and thirdly, because I don't really feel qualified to talk on the main topic of the, the day, uh, I'm an atheist. Um, it feels very strange to start a talk by telling you that. I've never had to do so before. Uh, uh, but I'm a friendly atheist, and to be honest, talking to you about faith, uh, and there are many people of faith in the room, feels a bit like going to give a lecture to fish about swimming. Yeah, I've tried it. I have some sense of what it's like, but uh, I'm clearly not the expert in the room. And so you'll forgive me if I don't stick to what I know. Um, I agree with almost everything Eric uh, said, a couple of. Um, Exception. I think it, there are clearly places where it's much harder to draw those lines that he was talking about into one talk about love and beauty and kissing. And I think if there were psychologists on the stage rather than astrophysicists, we could have a discussion about where exactly science stops in those areas. And I, I think there's something worrying as well about this implicit trust that we're to place in the scientists with a capital S. Uh, those of us who hang around in certain uh, kind of places where people talk about science communication know about something called the deficit model, which is the old idea um, that all you lot need to be scientists is to listen to us a bit more. Uh, and actually, a lot of my work, uh, and all of those days, is about making that dialogue more interesting and, and giving uh, large numbers uh, of, of the public tools to lead their own science and to discuss with us. So, uh, that's the health warning. Don't trust anything I say. Uh, we might rather an argument. Uh, and with that caveat, let me just tell you some excellent, amazing and interesting things about the universe. Uh, this is a map of our neighborhood. It may not look like what you've seen before. The Milky Way is in the middle of this map. Um, don't get distracted by the fact that it's shaped like a bow tie. Uh, the gaps above and below are the modern equivalent of here be dragons. It's the bits of the map we haven't filled in yet. But each dot in this map, and there are about a million of them, uh, is a galaxy. A galaxy is a system uh, of maybe a few hundred billion stars. Uh, and and the, this is our nearest million. You can see there's some structure to the universe. We have this slightly bubbly structure that we'll come back to. Uh, and, and I want to emphasize really that this is our local neighborhood. There's a million galaxies in this picture, but there are probably a few hundred billion in the bit of the universe to which we have access, which we can see. And so we've got one million out of 100 billion. Uh, we've got some work still to do. But we can make progress uh, with this stuff, and we can try and understand the large scale structure of the universe. So, for example, um, we can make some relatively simple measurements. This is old data. But what I've done here is each dot is one nearby galaxy. Uh, and I'm plotting the distance in some units that you don't care about, but think of it in millions of light years. So nearby galaxies are over here, or distant galaxies are over here. And then it turns out that if you look carefully at the galaxy and you analyze it, you find that you can tell whether the galaxy is coming towards you or moving away from you. You'll have heard perhaps of a phenomenon called redshift, which is heatless. But that doesn't matter. We can measure the speed of a galaxy. And so galaxies which are uh, coming towards us are down here or, that are moving slowly away from us, and then as we move up the screen here, um, they go further away. And you can see, uh, even in this rather crude data, uh, that there's a relationship here. To an astronomer, this is excellent data. So uh, we have a rule that as I move to the right, as I get further away, the galaxies recede faster from us. So the further away a galaxy is, the faster it's receding from us. That's called Hubble's law, uh, after Edwin Hubble. Uh, who was the person who first put or really popularized this sort of measurement. Uh, and this is his data. The more modern ones are a bit more convincing. We've got hundreds of millions of light years, tens of thousands of kilometers a second. This really nice, tight relationship. The further away a galaxy is, the faster it's receding from us. 
And what's nice about that is that's the only thing you need to get your head around this ridiculous idea, which you'll have heard of, that the universe is expanding. So, to show you that, the, the picture that made it click to my mind is this. Uh, this is an Escher drawing it's called Cubic Space Division. It's a deeply unromantic game, but never mind. Um, and I want you to imagine that we're living in this universe, not in our continent among the galaxies and people and so on, but in this very simple universe in which there are only cubes and rods. I want you to imagine that we're sitting on this cube down here, and I want you to imagine that all the rods are expanding. And they're all expanding at the same rate. So each rod is getting bigger, let's say, at 10 miles an hour. The number doesn't matter. And so if you think about what that would look like, the first thing you realize is that all the other cubes would be rushing away from us. We'd think we were sat safely on our nice cube down here, and we'd see all of the others rushing away from us. And that would be true whichever cube we were sitting in. So it's, you, you get the appearance of being at the center of this expansion, and in fact, there's no true center. Every cube will think it's the center of the expansion. The other thing that will happen is you'll, you'll get an interesting relationship. So if we're on this cube, this one up here will be going in that direction at 10 miles an hour. That was the rule. Each rod expands at 10 miles an hour. But the one in the top right, all the way up there, will be heading in the same direction, but it will appear to be going twice as fast. Because this rod is expanding, and the rod in the top right is expanding. And so the further away a cube is, the more rods divide, uh, connect us to it, and thus the faster it will appear to be receiving. So the further away a cube is, the faster it will receive from us. And so all I've got to do is replace the cubes with galaxies, and the rods with space itself, and allow space itself to expand. And then the further away a galaxy is, the faster it will appear to be receiving from us. And that's the key to understanding this notion of the expanding universe. It's not the galaxies rushing away from each other, it's the space between them expanding. Space, uh, in our modern picture of cosmology, is an actor. It's not just a solid stage, it's a stage which is expanding. And we recover this Hubble's law, um, and of course the expansion of space uh, isn't going 10 miles an hour, it's actually rather slow. If you took something like 3 million light years worth of space, then you have to add on 70 kilometers every second, which is a tiny amount. So this fundamental fact about our universe that is expanding, actually on an everyday level, doesn't have much effect. You know, I am not rushing away from the sun, the galaxies, it's still possible for some galaxies to collide, uh, the space within me isn't expanding, uh, it's just manifest on these very, very large scales. And once you've got that idea that space is expanding, of course, it's almost uh, impossible not to run this picture backwards in your mind, to make the rods shrink rather than grow. And notice that all the cubes end up in contact. There's a point in the past in which there would be no rods and just cubes. And in our universe, that's the point that we call the Big Bang. If we extrapolate backwards, then we reach this point where everything would have been at infinite density and at zero time, and we call that the Big Bang, and we know that our universe was in that state 13.8 billion years ago. And we know that number more accurately than we know the age of the Earth. So there are two reasons why that's true, two possible reasons why that's true. That startling fact that we know the age of the universe and more accurately than we know the age of the Earth. One is that it may be that astronomers are more intelligent than geologists. <laughs> I've refuted that by observation, so that's not true. Uh, the other possibility is that the universe is simple. We only really have to worry about gravity. Whereas in old times on the Earth, I have to worry about weather and chemistry uh, and, and all sorts of interesting physics, uh, whereas the universe on these large scales is a rather simple proposition. And that means that we can work out what the conditions would have been like just after the Big Bang itself. Uh, and in fact, it turns out that the big, it would have been a very hot universe. In fact, for the first few hundred thousand years, um, it would have been uh, so hot that neutral atoms, proton, electron, all together, neutral at atoms wouldn't be able to exist. The electrons would fly free. You'd have a plasma, rather a bit, a bit like on the surface, uh, or just under the surface of Eric's beloved sun. Uh, and we can look back that sun at SUN. By the way, I realise that this context, sorry. Uh, just the phrasing, that wasn't even deliberate, sorry. Um, 
I'll try not to confuse the magisteria any further. Um, anyway, um, <laughs> what's nice about this is that the idea of discussing the early universe doesn't have to stay a theoretical concept. I'm an observer. I like to try and understand the strong being and the universe by looking out at the cosmos. Because we have this remarkable ability in astronomy to look back in time. If you look at the sun, which we can do today, which is rather wonderful, and uh, perhaps it's always sunny in Melbourne, uh, but when you look at the sun, you see it not as it is now, but as it was eight minutes ago, because its light has taken eight minutes to reach us. You see stars as they were tens or hundreds or thousands of years ago, and we see distant galaxies as they were millions or even billions of years ago. So if I take a bunch of galaxies that I've, I've observed, and I arrange them in order of distance. What I'm doing is I'm, I'm looking at the universe at different stages in its evolution. And so a nice simple test of the Big Bang Theory uh, is that galaxies that are a long way away, like these over here, which we see as they were 10 or 11 billion years ago, should look rather different than the ones that we see today. You can see there is a trend on this picture as we go from the old universe to the modern day universe. You can see, for example, that these galaxies are rather scrawny. And galaxies in the early universe are indeed smaller because they collide and build up bigger things. You can also see that they're bluer uh, than these galaxies. And this is the uh, rest, uh, taken out the effect of the expansion of the universe. Uh, and, and the blue means that these galaxies are forming stars at a prodigious rate. So you can actually see our universe getting rather tired over time. Our universe is, I'm afraid, past its best. More stars are now dying than are being born, and you can see that reflected here. And of course, the stars in these galaxies are younger than the stars that we see in galaxies today. So we have this nice picture of the past, and we can expand it backwards uh, if we use a rather different scale. So let's take all the galaxies over here, and one can get back to this epoch where uh, things were rather hotter. Some of the most interesting stuff happens uh, maybe during the first three minutes after the Big Bang. Uh, at that point, the temperature is so high that the particles are whizzing around with great velocity, and they're able to collide, and there's a period where the entire universe uh, is pretending to be the center of a star like the sun, in that it's fusing hydrogen together to form helium. And so, um, we, we, it's called Big Bang Nucleosynthesis. Essentially, we make the first building blocks of atoms in the first few minutes, and we can predict with great accuracy, the relationship between the amount of hydrogen, uh, the amount of deuterium as well, and the amount of uh, helium that should exist in the universe. And while we have to worry about stars adding to our stock of helium, uh, we can test those observations by looking at those ratios of different galaxies. And we find uh, that the theory passes the test. But let's think about, we're over here in one of these galaxies. And let's look back. As we look out, we can look past the stars, past the distant galaxies, back even further than 11 billion years uh, after the Big Bang, I can look all the way back to this time, this time 300,000 years after the beginning. And the situation is rather, rather odd. What's true before this time, as I've said already, is that the electrons uh, that will go on to make atoms, or protons, are free floating. And that means that if I have something that emits light, on average, light will travel just a centimetre or two before it hits one of these electrons. And then it will bounce off and hit another electron a centimetre or two later. And then it will bounce off and hit another electron a centimetre or two later. Uh, being there would be uh, deeply uncomfortable, but it would also be like being in a luminous fog. You wouldn't be able to see more than a centimetre or so in front of your face because the light would be scattering around. It would be uh, a rather strange experience. As the universe expanded, it cooled. And there's a point about 380,000 years, according to our latest measurements, after the Big Bang, where the electrons have lost enough energy because of that cooling that they can be captured by the protons. And neutral atoms form in the universe for the first time. It's in many ways the most significant event in the entire history of the universe. Um, because what it does is it makes the universe transparent. Before that event, light can only travel a centimetre or so. After that event, light can typically travel right across the observable universe without climbing anything. And so if we look back to that time, 
there's a really nice analogy. This is an Anthony Gormley sculpture, um, which I think really clearly illustrates what's going on. So we have a source of light inside what was a very large box of fog in the Hayden Gallery in London. Um, and you can't see that light because it's hidden by the fog. So the light from the light bulb that's in there somewhere, I did spend about an hour trying to find the source of light so I could get a picture of it, and I failed utterly. Um, but what's happening is light is being emitted, and in this case, it's hitting with, with traveling a centimeter or so and hitting a water molecule. It's traveling a centimeter or so and hitting a water molecule. It's traveling a centimeter or so and hitting the water molecules on. Uh, and bouncing around, and that continues pretty much randomly uh, until you reach the edge of this box. And then if your light is lucky, it will scatter, travel out through the box, and suddenly it's in a transparent medium, and it can travel right across the room into the camera. And so from our perspective, when we look back, it looks like the edge of the box is glowing. What we have is a picture of the water molecules at the edge of the box, even though the source of light is deep within it. And so this is what looking back at the early universe is like. If we stand here and look back towards the early universe, uh, what we see is the surface from which the light last scattered. We get a map of the universe just at the point that the electrons were captured. So we can map the universe as it was 380,000 years after the beginning, after the Big Bang. This was done first by uh, a couple of engineers pen, uh, and, and scientists, Penzias and Wilson, um, we're working for Bell Labs, uh, investigating sources of background noise. Um, and I used to enjoy telling people that if you had a, uh, a pre-digital television um, and you get black and white static because you managed to screw up the tuning, uh, then about 2% of that static was the radiation left over from this time just after the Big Digital television has ruined this for me. <laughs> I was giving a talk to my old school the other day, no one knew what I was talking about. But nonetheless, <laughs> I think at least three of you in the audience are old enough to have lived in this pre-digital uh, and you'll be able to, to, to think about this. And um, anyway, so we can make this map. Penny S. and Wilson were, were dedicated and wonderful scientists, so I think deserve a uh, huge acclaim for finding this background noise, and for not just saying, and there is a residual effect of 2% which we cannot explain. You know, they bothered to chase it down. Uh, they bothered to rule out the possibility that uh, this background hum wasn't due to pigeons which had been nesting in their antenna. And according to the paper, uh, the pigeons had left a white dielectric substance in a great quantity uh, amongst the electronics. But that was scrubbed out, and yet they still perceive it, and they found uh, what we now see is this picture. So this is a map of the whole sky. It's a bubble around us. Um, and it's a picture of that early universe. And, and the colors here represent your choice of temperature or density. So the, the blue bits are slightly colder regions of the early universe. Um, and the red bits are slightly hotter. The cold bits are slightly denser. So they're places where there's slightly more stuff. Uh, and the red bits are places where there's slightly less stuff. Uh, and these fluctuations are remarkable because they're the seeds which go on uh, to allow us to form that magnificent map that I started the talk with. Uh, and I just want to talk a bit about how that happens. I should point out as well, um, you know, one needs to be careful uh, what one has faith in, of course, and it's been pointed out recently that Stephen Hawking's initials uh, are buried within this map. So if you're looking for a signature on creation, this is as close as I've got for you, I'm afraid. Um, there's also a rather nice phoenix, uh, and I believe there's somewhere a nice image of Bambi. But you have to look closely, and you have to look uh, either, well, perhaps not with entirely serious state, but you have to, so you have to start um, looking for patterns that, that you expect to find. Anyway, this is, so to understand the stuff, we can resort to another tool uh, of modern science, we can resort to computer simulations. Because now I've got a picture of what the universe was like 80,000 years after the beginning. And I've already said that the universe is rather simple, so all we have to care about is gravity. I can use big supercomputers to make a universe that matches that early picture and then allow gravity to do its thing. And so this is a, a printout, if you like, from such a simulation. Um, I chose this one particularly because the supercomputer in question, which is in Barcelona, uh, is housed in a disused medieval church. 
which I think makes it a postmodern simulation, apart from everything else. Uh, but the, the stone walls are brilliant for keeping computers cold, and it, it works rather well. Uh, and this is the state of the computerized universe 15 million years after the beginning uh, of the simulation, so 15 million years after the Big Bang. And the color here is density. So where, uh, where points are bright, they have slightly more stuff than the average, and where they're dark, they have slightly less stuff than the average. Let's just think for a second about what's going to happen. So if I put a blob of material here, and we, um, I might want to ask the question of whether it's going to go to the right or to the left. And you can see there's already a blob here that has slightly more stuff than the average. Its gravitational pull is going to be stronger than this area, which has slightly less. And so things are going to tend to move towards places that already have more than the average. It's sort of a cosmic, uh, rich get richer, and poor get poorer, and which sadly turns out to be a fundamental rule if you let gravity do its thing. Um, and so you go from 15 million years to a billion years to 5 billion years to the present day, uh, and what you see is that that rather subtle structure that we started with becomes exaggerated. And we end up back with uh, the sort of honeycombed, cobwebbed universe uh, that I had on my first slide. Um, you can see that rather more clearly, I think, than if that's working with the lights. Uh, but this is a movie of the same process, and you can see each little blob here might be a proto-galaxy. Thank you. Uh, we'll leave that off the next slide, so that's great. So each blob here might be a proto-galaxy ascending into the clusters of filaments that you think make up the universe. Well, what's nice about the computerized universe is I know the rules that exist for the computer, because colleagues of mine put them there. And so I could do this many times. I could change how much stuff there is in the universe, how much math there is. I could change, if I wanted to, the strength of gravity. I could look at, could change the amount of time that's elapsed since the Big Bang. And I could do all of those things and then compare to uh, our observed universe. So I'm going to show you another map of the universe. This is going to be uh, from the telescope in New Mexico called the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, which for eight years mapped about 300 million objects. Uh, about a million of them were galaxies and they went and made a three-dimensional map of the universe. So we're starting on the Milky Way again and traveling out amongst the galaxies. So each blob here is one of these island universes, these uh, systems of hundreds of billions of stars, relatively isolated from each other. And somewhere around here, you begin to see that structure that we saw in the computerized universe emerging. So you begin to see uh, places where there are lots of galaxies, places where there are relatively few galaxies. This C-shaped thing here is called the Sloan Great Wall. It's the biggest thing uh, that we know about. And in a minute, we'll stop and rotate, and we have this honeycomb structure. The good news uh, is that we can get the computerized universe to match the observed universe to really rather uh, high precision. We can ask all sorts of statistical questions. We can say, well, how empty are the emptiest bits of this universe? How uh, many Milky Way-sized galaxies are there? Uh, how big are the biggest galaxy clusters? And all of those questions check out. Uh, and just to give you a scale, uh, I think we'll zoom out and see the microwave background. So this is in light travel time for those who, who want technicalities. It gives you a sense of how much of the universe that we, uh, the, how much of the universe we mapped. Um, so this is our view of the universe. Remember, we appear to be in the center just as we picked a particular cube to sit on. Uh, we've got our galaxies, and here's our, our view of the uh, 380,000 year universe. So all of this adds together rather nicely. We have an expanding universe. We have gravity acting within it uh, to produce uh, clusters of galaxies and Milky Way like galaxies. And the big picture, uh, it seems, works rather well. Uh, this particular universe happens to be in the computer at the University of Chicago, but I don't think that's true for our universe, uh, as far as I know. Um, and one can then ask, okay, so that's the beginning. We have a Big Bang-like event, um, and we can ask the question, what happens to the universe in the future? Sticking with the idea that the universe is simple, all we have to do is worry about is gravity. It turns out that the critical thing is we just need to pin down the amount of matter, the amount of stuff in the universe. Because the more stuff we have, the more important gravity becomes. And the more important gravity becomes, the more it can stop this cosmic expansion. So if you think about it for a second, there are sort of three possibilities. So one possibility is that there's lots of stuff in the universe. So gravity is much more important than the expansion. 
We normally call this the categories of the closed universe. It's represented by this red line here. So we have a universe that expands, the Big Bang's here in this case, the universe would expand, 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 the gravity would be pulling all the time, and slowing down the expansion, and you may get to a point where the expansion actually stops, and then starts reversing. So then we have a contracting universe, uh, all the way down uh, to this. And this is the opposite of the Big Bang, which uh, I heard Brad Schmidt, who's a, a Nobel Prize winning scientist, in Australia, and therefore can't be argued with, called the Gnab Gnib, which is the opposite of the Big Bang. Uh, <laughs> which I need to get better at learning to say. So yes, so from Big, I nearly called the talk from Big Bang to Gnab Gnib. Um, anyway, and, and, and this is beloved of, of scientists who worry about, particularly philosophical scientists, um, because it's very tempting to assert, with no evidence, but we can assert that maybe this baffles us. Like maybe there's a rule that says that once your universe gets down to a tiny infinitesimal size, you know, maybe 10, uh, a billionth of a billionth of a second before the, the zero that we'd be calling Big Bang, maybe it rebounds. And then we can have a bouncing universe forevermore. Uh, and also all the way back into the past. So this is a beautiful uh, idea uh, which would get rid of the need to start this process off. We then have an eternally bouncing universe. Of course, we can live in a different Universe. We can live in a universe where there isn't very much stuff, and in fact, where uh, gravity is relatively unimportant. We call that an open universe. And there, it's the blue line, the universe just gets bigger forever. It's a fairly boring uh, possibility. There's also this green case, uh, where the universe has just enough stuff uh, to stop it expanding, but not enough to reverse it. So the expansion of the universe gets slower and slower and slower and slower and slower. The universe will approach uh, a maximum size, but it will never quite revert. Uh, and this would be a special case in between the two. And so for, for 20 or 30 years, uh, at the end of the last century, uh, one of the goals of cosmology, study of the universe as a whole, was to work out which of these tracks we were on. And one way to do that is to repeat Hubble's experiment. So remember, Hubble uh, measured the distance to lots of galaxies and the velocity with which they were receding from us. But he did so only for relatively local galaxies, a tiny fraction of the whole universe. Which means he measured the expansion of the universe as it is today. And that 70 kilometers per second that I gave you is the expansion rate of the universe today. But if we look further afield, then we can measure the expansion of the universe as it was in the past. We have this ability to look back in time. And then we can plot at least this bit of the curve. And in the 90s, two groups of astronomers decided to do this, um, particularly by looking for uh, exploding stars called supernovae. In particular, uh, they look at something called a Type 1a supernova, which I won't bother you with. And this is a recent example, which is very exciting. This is a galaxy called M82, uh, the Cigar Galaxy, if you prefer. Uh, this was it at the start of January, this was it at the end of January. Um, you can see a new star so here. This is a, the nearest type 1a supernova for the last 150 years or so. It was discovered by a bunch of undergraduate students at University College London, uh, which I thought was rather fabulous. Um, but, but when scientists started being able to find these things in distant galaxies and make uh, the version of this plot, they came up with a rather surprising result. I've been saying repeatedly that the only force we have to worry about is gravity. And gravity pulls things together. And so imagine the surprise of these scientists when, when they looked at their supernovae, they discovered that the universe is not slowing down. The expansion of the universe has, for the last few billion years, been speeding up uh, at cosmic acceleration. And we don't understand what's caused that speeding up. We give it the name dark energy, which I hate. I don't know what it means for energy to be dark. Uh, but it's a placeholder for some force which is pushing space out uh, ever faster. We have some ideas, but, but no clear sense. And that's the most important thing in the universe today. It beats gravity uh, by miles, and that's why the universe is expanding. So that means that the picture that we have of the universe's future is essentially what dominated by this acceleration. And that has some interesting effects. It means that the portion of the universe that we're able to study is dropping. Stuff is disappearing over our cosmic horizon. And in the far future, we'll be left with just our galaxy. 
Uh, it will have merged with the neighboring Andromeda galaxy, but then nonetheless, we reckon our galaxy and the stars will all die. Um, the sunlight stars will produce white dwarfs, small cinders to the left, they will fade slowly. Bigger stars will produce black holes. Uh, and over time, the black holes themselves, thanks to a piece of physics called Hawking radiation, which is what Stephen Hawking will be remembered for, uh, that and his initials in the CMB. Um, Hawking radiation means that those black holes will, over the course of billions and 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 millions of years, will evaporate. And so the long-term future for the universe is as nothing more than a sea of fading radiation. It's a deeply depressing picture, but there may be hope. And the hope is, the hope is that if, I have no evidence of this, um, but, the, but scientists often assert, particularly my theoretical colleagues, like to assert um, that maybe universes can bump new universes. And let's say this is an incredibly unlikely proposition. So the odds of our universe creating a new universe which has its own Big Bang, um, it's a terrible illustration, but I guess it's good to see it in the dark. This is supposed to be our universe bumping off these new universes. If this, is even if this is incredibly unlikely, given that we have an infinity to wait in which the universe will expand as a sea of nothing but radiation, this will eventually happen. And a new universe will uh, pop up. Now, we don't know whether this is possible. It seems plausible, given some of the wilder ideas of theoretical physics. But this, then, is uh, the modern sense of what the long-term future of the universe looks like. An interesting time in which it stars and planets, and then a long retirement uh, before the cycle starts again. And one can even get as far as postulating that these new universes may inherit their properties from the universe in which they got off. Uh, in which case, each one of them will go on to produce stars and galaxies and planets, and presumably life uh, in some proportion of them, uh, maybe even astronomers, um, and maybe even gin and tonic. Who knows? Um, that's my definition of a civilized universe, by the way. But these universes may uh, continue, of course, to have universes of their own. And we have, uh, this will have happened for an infinite amount of time in the past, and an infinite amount of time in the future. Now, that, I admit, is speculation. But isn't it fun? Thank you. <laughs>